You're watching CHCO TV's gavel to gavel coverage of the June 17, 2024 regular council meeting for the town of St. Andrews. I'm Florence Mitchell. In today's meeting, under Planning and Community Development, Councillors Harland and Heenan will move that Council grants leave for the second readings of Amendments MP20-09 and Z22-08 for Charlie Bartlett at 232 Bayview Drive. Under Public Works and Public Safety, Councillors Bennett and Neal will present a report on the O'Neill Farm Road flooding. In addition, Councillors Bennett and Neal will move that Council moves to request permission from the Provincial Minister of Natural Resources and Energy Development for approval of the 2024 nuisance deer hunt. Under Economic Development, Business and Culture, Councillors Hurdle and Weir will move that Council rescinds the Ad Hoc Tourism Promotion Committee and approves Explore St. Andrews as the tourism partner under the Tourism Accommodation Levy. Finally, under Recreation and Environment, Councillors Gumichel and Blanchard will move that Council supports the development of a food forest at a 1.6 acre lot at the corner of Acadia Road and Champlain Avenue and direct staff to create a memorandum of understanding for use of this land. Now let's join Council at the W.C. O'Neill Arena Complex Council Chambers. All right, let's call to order the regular council meeting for the Town of St. Andrews, Monday, June 17th, 2024. We are live here from the W.C. O'Neill Arena Complex uh, Chambers, but we are also uh, being streamed through Zoom and Facebook. If anyone has any questions related to the agenda this evening, you're welcome to join us on Zoom, but also you can email pnopper at townofstandrews.ca. So I note that all members of council are here with the exception of Councillor Hurdle and Blanchard. Uh, and I do want to recognize that we are on the unceded traditional territory of the Beskotomogadi people. The approval of agenda, I'll be looking for an approval uh, of the agenda. I need a mover for that. We've got Councillor Neal and second it got by Councillor Bennett. Um, any changes to the agenda? Okay. There may be an opportunity to go to third reading in one of the motions tonight, but we'll talk about it at that particular time. Um, so I'll call the question. All in favor of approving the agenda, please signify by saying aye. Aye. That's everybody. Agenda has been approved. Disclosure, disclosure of conflict of interest. Not seeing any. Let me know if anything arises. And we have no presentations. We had uh, four already this month. Uh, and uh, we already approved the minutes and already did the uh, staff report. So we're jumping way ahead now to the introduction, consideration, and passing of bylaws and motions, which is obviously the bulk of the meeting. And Councillor Harlan will kick it off this evening. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. Um, this is reference number PCD 240402, and it's amendment MP20-09 to the municipal plan MP20-01 and Z22-08 to the zoning bylaws Z22-01, Charlie Bartlett, PID 15156425, 232 Bayview Drive, second reading. And the background is as follows. The Town of St. Andrews has received an application for rezoning PID 15156425-232 Bayview Drive for Charlie Bartlett. The applicant is proposing a retail fishmonger in the existing burn on site. The amendment steps for council have been as follows. Public presentation on May 6, 2024. Public hearing of objections on June 3rd, 2024. Obtaining views of PAC May 22, 2024. First reading June 3, 2024. Second reading, reading, third and final reading. Prior to the third and final reading of the zoning bylaw amendment, staff are recommending terms and conditions for the property. And the motion is as follows that the council, the first motion is as follows that the council of the town of St. Andrews grants leave for second reading to amendment MP20-09 to the municipal plan MP20-01 for PID 15156425 Charlie Bartlett at 232 Bayview Drive and I so move. Thank you, could I have a seconder for that? I've got Councillor Heenan, discussion. Okay, all in favor of going to second reading, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? It's nobody. This is bylaw number MP20-09, a bylaw to amend the bylaw number MP20-01 being the municipal plan bylaw for the town of St. Andrews. 
Read the second time, the 17th day of June of 2024. Next motion. Thank you. And the next motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews grants leave for second reading to Amendment Z22-08 to the Zoning Bylaw Z22-01 for PID 1515-6425, Charlie Bartlett at 232 Bayview Drive. And I so move. And I'll be looking for a seconder once again. Councillor Gumashell, discussion on this one? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor of going to second reading, please signify by saying aye. Aye. That's everybody. This is bylaw number Z22-08, a bylaw to amend bylaw Z22-01, being the zoning bylaw for the town of St. Andrews, read the 17th day of June 2024. Now, Council, um, for this one, um, it's staff's recommendation, I believe, as well. We've received really no input from the community of any concern, um, so we could go to third reading right now if you'd like to. Um, I just I need consensus to do that, would I? Is that safe to say? Yeah, so a quick, uh, quick show of hands if you'd like to go to third reading. All right, that's that's majority. All right, so, yep. Sorry, can I just get some clarification from staff on staff? Absolutely, we'll, we'll put it in now. In case, I don't know if it's pertaining to the third reading, but go ahead now because it's pertaining to the issue. Uh, yeah, thank you, Your Worship. It was just had to do with the, the background info we got received on the, uh, on the sidewalk that mentioned, uh, again, 80 meters to 100 meters, and then suddenly it jumped to 1.1 kilometers. Um, my, my apologies, it is up to 100 meters. So I assumed it's, it was about 110 meters? 110 meters, correct. And then I'm just wondering if that cost estimate of $100,000 is still accurate. Yes. Uh, after speaking with... After $1,000 speaking, a meter? Correct. After speaking with uh, Terry Acton, Asset Operations Manager, similar to what was uh, developed at the corner of Harriet uh, at, um, uh, by the Algonquin running down the road, uh, that last block that was done there was approximately $100,000 from... Harriet Street from Carlton to um, uh, Prince of Wales Street was $100,000. So it's approximately the same length that would be needed. And for that 110 meters, that would require another employee and a piece of equipment? Through you, Your Worship, based on the information provided by our asset manager, uh, they're already maxed out for the allotment of how much sidewalks they can do. Any additional sidewalks, trails, or anything else would would require another man and machine to be able to do and keep up with the snow clearing. So from our understanding and what we've been told is after they're done clearing the snow on the sidewalks, they're literally going behind with the trucks with the snow clearing machines to clear the snow from the sides of the roads. And in order to keep up with that, they still need two machines and two guys. So any additional sidewalks or any additional clearing that is required or requested by council would need another body and another machine. Safe to assume on that that that'll be a conversation we have during budget time. It wouldn't be a budget position. The sidewalks a major capital project when you're talking 100000 That's all stuff for budget time. But, uh, yeah, sidewalks cost a lot of money, that's for sure. Mr. Spear? Yes, Your Worship. I guess besides the cost... Of that stuff it should be noted that if you if you did a physical drive that these pictures just because they're from google earth doesn't do it justice but a lot of those trees are probably going to be displaced if you go by there now to make the proper width for the sidewalks if you're going to go on the it's be the east side, yeah, we'll have to be on the east side. <clears throat> and uh because i thought well it looks like room but then when i drove by there uh, last week i thought yikes so that you'd lose some of those trees along the algonquin fairway are those sorry Go ahead. Yep. are those um the veteran trees <clears throat> that you'll be removing the you know families have paid for those to be placed there honestly i don't sorry. know i don't those think veteran trees that i don't think so because the veteran trees aren't that big they haven't matured that much okay like if you notice the ones along um along mowat and reed um or just reed sorry so but I'm not 100% sure about that, but those trees look like they're probably 30 plus years old from the height and the width of their bases especially. Okay. Councilor Gibbish. So, uh, not in regard to this exactly, but moving forward with regard to the sidewalk, I always presumed that the, uh, the Algonquin home right to the side of the road because that's where the out-of-bounds markers were playing golf, not that I was ever talking about it. <laughs> 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 wink, but wink. The white markers were right along the side of the road. But when I'm, when I'm uh, inferring is that the town has an option there if we had uh, hundreds of thousand dollars in the future to add sidewalk all along the old, but I guess that's what the fourth pole now, the old 18th pole. At some point in the future, we could do that. I believe so. I think where you see the rock wall there is probably the edge of the Algonquin property. 
would be my guess. But from a different perspective too, Council, I think that's an inefficient use of a sidewalk because we're really just talking to access, you know, quick access to Tim Hortons. And for this particular business that most people are facing onto Thomas Avenue as you go up there a little further. So there's probably better spots in town if we're going to discuss this about where a sidewalk would make a lot more sense, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't end it there. Like like there's a play in the future. Huntsman's talked about a knowledge park. Like who knows how far it could go out in order to make the town more, I guess you could say, walk walker friendly or or, or accessible. Um, but again, I, I think that it's such a big conversation. Um, there's no funding model for it. I, I, let's put this in the parking lot for budget time. We always have items that are outstanding that we always talk about. Um, because again, it sounds very similar to Prince of Wales. You start getting into cutting right. trees and things like that. And obviously we'd want to have a conversation with the golf course because they're doing their best to try to increase it in the rankings into the municipality, went and cut a bunch of trees right along it. I, I yeah, they, we, there, there needs to be a conversation there for sure. Um, so, uh, if council's good with that, uh, Councilor Harlan, do you mind? Uh, your worship. Oh, sorry. Councilor Heaton. Thank you. Yes, your worship and council. In my opinion, the fishmonger uh, is more of a driving destination to leave out of town. Like, that's what I picture this as, is someone leaving St. Andrews to pick up fish to take home with them. I don't see it as some as a really walking destination. I may be wrong, but I do see it as more of a vehicle uh, sort of drop in. And so, um, as I said, once you pass that corner, you know, it's mostly vehicle traffic. I, that's how I look at it anyway, and I just wanted to make that point because I see it as a, as a real asset for people coming into town and people going out of town. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, and I can't see too many people walking with live lobster down the no, street. That's what I'm <laughs> Especially in the heat wave we're about to get. Yeah. <laughs> All right, is that anyone else? And then Your I'll, Worship, yep. just clarification. So there are, it is recommended that council apply terms and conditions to this development. Uh, there were three terms and conditions that were provided within your package on page 15. Uh, one is in regards to waste bags must be double bagged and placed in a lockable dumpster to prevent animal access, as well as the dumpster must be screened and fenced as per zoning bylaw. Um, the second one really should be that the facility ha must maintain a public washroom. The third one, as it relates to paved parking lots, I'm going to pass it to Xander Gopin, uh, senior planner, to explain uh, potential variants for it. Thanks, Mr. Knopper. Um, so I think I kind of alluded to this previously. Uh, so this is a requirement in the zoning bylaw that commercial parking lots be paved. Um, but as this is maybe, uh, you know, it's a lease business, um, they're leasing a the building. And also really, I think moving forward, uh, given increasing concerns, concerns around stormwater runoff, um, having more paved spaces is less and less seen as a good practice. And there are ways to achieve, um, you know, attractive and durable parking areas that don't actually involve a ton of paving. Um, there's there's pervious things, there's, you know, gravel is, is uh, in many situations fine um, and creates less challenges for stormwater runoff. So if um, this might, this is probably something we'll look more in depth at when we're discussing the, the new zoning bylaw, but in this kind of transitory phase, um, the, the simplest way if council does not feel it is uh, important for this parking lot to be paved with asphalt as is required for the zoning bylaw. Um, my recommendation is that the applicant uh, apply for a variance, and this is something that can be done by a development officer. Um, it doesn't have to go to PAC uh, to basically say it can be a um, non, it could be a, a dust proof, basically. There's, there's some language for it we would use. Uh, dust proof material, which was gravel, uh, you know, compacted gravel usually is. Um, dust proof material. And in uh, two years, one or two years, uh, this variance would expire and could be revisited at that time, depending on the business and how things have gone. Um, and also that it be maintained in good condition. So if you do end up with a situation where you have tons and tons of vehicles and, and it seems like, you know, it's getting into bad shape uh 
then that could be dealt with and enforced on uh, through the variance. So um, rather than council, council can't really take away uh, a zoning bylaw requirement with a condition. That would have to be a separate amendment to the zoning bylaw. Um, and, I, and I think given the timeline for this and that we're going to be reviewing the zoning bylaw soon, it, it doesn't make sense to go that route. So the variance is the, the best way to go, uh, in my opinion. So just to shorten that council, basically they could get a variance for one or two years. In the meantime, we're going to be up zone, we're going to be updating our municipal plan and zoning bylaw. There may be new materials that we allow outside of paving where commercial properties can have. At that time, at the end of the one to two year, the applicant would have to become compliant with the zoning bylaw. Otherwise, the time period for the variance would be expired and they'd be outside of our zoning bylaw. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so when we set terms and conditions, we'll only be reading the first and third one, but uh, I can help you with that one after. But first, the order would be that we um, go to third reading for the municipal plan, then we set the terms and conditions as the next action, and then the third would be um, to do the amendment to the zoning bylaw. Okay, so if you want to just do the first one, then we'll add the next one in, and then we'll do the last one. Sure. Okay, thank you. Do I have to read the whole thing? You have to read the whole motion. Just, so take your second your second reading motion and just replace it with the second reading with the third yep. reading. Okay. No, ba no background in it, though. Okay. Um, so the following motion that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews grants leave for third and final reading to amendment MP20-09 to the municipal plan MP20-01 for PID 15156425 Charlie Bartlett as Sorry, at 232 Bayview Drive, and I so move. I'll be looking for a seconder to go to third reading for the municipal plan as well. Councillor Heenan. Um, all in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. That is everybody. This is bylaw number MP20-09, being a bylaw to amend bylaw number MP20-01, being the municipal plan for the town of St. Andrews. We're at the 17th day of June of 2024. And now the next one, do you? Do I you think so. You think you got it? Okay. I think. Um, that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews grants leave for third and... No, no, no. 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 So it would be that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews sets uh, the following terms and conditions okay. for PID 15156425, Charlie Bartlett at 232 Bayview Drive. And those would be that the waste bags must be double bagged and placed in a lockable dumpster to prevent animal access. The dumpster must be screened in by fencing as per the zoning bylaw Z22-01 and that the facility must contain a public washroom. Okay. So would you like to move that? I would like to move that. Okay, can I have exactly a second there for that? Councillor Heenan again, any discussion on those terms and conditions? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor of those terms and conditions, please signify by saying aye. 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 That's everybody, the terms and conditions have been set, and now we're going to the last one of this. Got it, I think. That the Council of the Town of St. Andrews grants leave for the third and final reading to amendment Z22-08 to the zoning bylaw Z22-01 for PID 15156425, Charlie Bartlett at 232 Bayview Drive, and I so move. Thank you. Looking for a seconder? Councillor Neal, any discussion on this one? All in favor of going to third reading, please signify by saying aye. Once again, that's everybody. So we're doing bylaw number Z22-08, a bylaw to amend bylaw Z22-01, being the zoning bylaw for the town of St. Andrews, read the third time on the 17th day of June of 2024. All right, that takes care of that one. And uh, jumping back to the agenda, now we're having a discussion in regards to the NBCC housing project. Uh, so I don't know if it's uh, Mr. Spear, I assume. Um, we're, as you know, we had several options put before us uh, in a meeting last week that not all of you are able to attend, but we're trying to figure out um, next steps with the housing proposal for the NBCC project. Uh, the architects have come up with three kind of conceptual drawings, if you will, that they thought fit in well with the neighborhood, and one of them was that also that their, a fourth story would be allowed. Now, they provided, I don't want to jump all over the place too much here, but for those that missed the meeting, if you jump to page, doo -doo 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 -doo. P, 
page uh, 29 of the of the uh, of the um, agenda. So we'll talk. So what the the first part is on on the fourth story. So the, the reason for the fourth story is the building would have less of a physical footprint. It'd be the same number of units, but it would be higher up. So they would be less of a footprint, which also allows for more heating efficiencies and less use of land. And so they think it's something worth talking about. If you look at the, the height study that they had on the page I showed you, we talked about page 29, what they're saying is that from Augusta Street, anyone fronting in front of the NPCC won't be able to see the four story, that it's going over the height of the building. So that line that shows there is like the visual that the front of the NBCC building will hide that four story. Uh, what, of course, you can see it from the public works side on Patrick Street and then um, over on Argyle Crescent. They didn't uh, do a study from that side and, and there's a large tree buffer there, but still the four story would probably be a little bit more noticeable. So they'd like to be able to discuss, you know, to discuss this and to get some reaction from you on this. Uh, number two was the building, uh, I guess, what the outside of it's going to look like. And it goes from pages 25 through 27. And again, Council, we're not making final decisions, but we're just making decisions so we can have conceptual designs, provide some um, some budget estimates for when we go to funding partners, et cetera. And so this is for them to be able to kind of start that next high level estimate. And, and as we begin to present things to the um, community about this, that you have something to bring forward. So building option one is on page 25. On page 26 and 27 are, are options two and three. From our meetings with the architects last Wednesday, those that were in attendance uh, seemed to prefer options two or three. And as long as three wasn't beyond, if the pricing was close enough, and really it's just adding some gables, I think they'd be called, uh, on the front of the building to give it a, a little more of a I don't want to use the word heritage look, but it kind of fits in with the, with our community a little better. That seemed to be the preference of those that attended. There was also a discussion on that the footprint currently includes a daycare. Our understanding is that there's just dedicated space for daycare without getting into what it looks like. The, it's the equivalent of three apartments. This, that actually can be decided later in the process a little bit because at this point we're just looking at the outside, the layout, the grounds and stuff and not getting deep into what, what, what's inside. In fact, probably a daycare would be less to build than a, just because of the larger spaces, less than a, um, apartments. So what I'm looking for you tonight is what option for the conceptual would you prefer? And B, would you entertain a four story? Again, before we do any of that, we'd have to go to rezoning, and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff to talk about with the public, but it just gives them the ability to do the drawings, engineer studies and stuff to continue the process with this. And so I'm looking for direction of council, what instructions to give our team at Housing Hub and the architect at OBDA. Perfect. So um, just to take the daycare off the table, what you already have is uh, obviously we know the uh, board of the Passaquoddy Lodge is working hard. Part of their plan is to have a daycare for intergenerational living on the campus. Um, so I think before we went too far down any route, I think we need to all, everyone needs to align in the community versus working in silos and one finding out the other is moving ahead without them. Um, that might be a good location uh, out of the Passaquoddy Lodge, uh, the new proposal, but the reality is, is we have challenges in our community now, and if they're not going to be successful getting fund funding, then this is an opportunity we should look at. But we'll just keep the lines of communication open with them, and we can decide that later. It's just the difference between, like you said, three units. So um, let's start, I guess, with the height, and then we'll go to the design. Um, 
you know, I, I, I do believe personally, and I, I want to weigh in with all of you, that if there was ever a location in town that you could do a four-story building, this is certainly the location. I don't think it really alters the look and feel of our community too much. I do have a little bit of concern over residents in Argyle Court where it's not towering over or shadowing their neighborhood. Um, but on the other side of that, uh, the other side of the argument, I already know there's a developer that's asking to try to get a four-story building in the town. And you are setting, even though it's a different location, a little bit of a precedence when you as a town decide that you can do a four-story building and then when a developer comes, you say no. And we all know from downtown and some of the proposals we get, everyone looks at the Kennedy and says, well, I can be as high or not 10% higher than the Kennedy. Well, everyone kind of builds around and, and, and we talk about what we want to be development friendly but not alter the look and feel of our community. So just a little bit of caution on the other side of that. So I, I see it both ways. Council, over to you and your thoughts on a four-story versus a three-story. Councilor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship. Um, I would be all for the fourth story. However, uh, we do know what, as you have spoken, that uh, we do have troubles with that, and we would be setting a precedent. So that would be that would be what I would see would hold this up uh, a long time and and maybe defeat it. Uh, so I worry that if we're looking at trying to get the architects into their second phase or whatever, I don't know how we can do that. With the, with the question mark of the fourth floor because it has to have public, and, and we know that's not going to work. I mean, I would put my next paycheck on it, that it may not work, that we could get it passed. But I would think that this is the right place for the fourth floor. But once we do it, we ha we've opened ourselves up. And I 100% support the fourth floor is just trying to get it into motion would be the problem and i'd hate to see this fall behind deadlines because of that that's just my concern thank you your worship thank, thank you councillor heenan councillor gumashal uh thank you worship i like the way councillor heenan's wagering his paycheck yes. <laughs> i think that's a great precedent um as far as uh, as far as the fourth floor this uh, this the, as everyone knows, the uh, community college, MBCC, is a key economic driver in our community. And uh, I think if they could put in a fourth floor, have less of a footprint and uh, um, complement the college, this is one project where a uh, four-story works and uh, um, we're, we, can, we can make decisions with regard to other four-story buildings as they come forward. I don't think we're necessarily set, setting precedent. This is uh, down in behind the college. Um, near the area that used to be the dump back in the day. So uh, I think this is, uh, as, as the mayor indicated, um, the one spot where we could have a four-story building. And if you look at the sight lines in the drawing, um, I, think, uh, I think you wouldn't really notice it. So I'd be all in favor of a four-story building in this place and would give the, give the uh, architects a chance to go ahead and uh, bring that forward. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councilor Grimshaw. Councilor Bennett. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would like to to know some of the some of the uh, costs associated with putting a four floor on. Like, uh, you know, are we looking at a, is is it five percent more to to go up versus out? Uh, there there should be some numbers that uh, somebody can tell us to give us an example of what we'd be looking at. No different than uh, you know just to, to step back a little bit and talk about the, the design aspect. Uh, putting on all those gables and the bump outs and stuff uh, in in some of the the second and the third rendition uh, of the design, uh, lovely as they are, uh, it costs money to do so, and I, I think it's irresponsible for us to make these decisions without having some form. I don't and I don't expect that anybody's going to give us an exact number, but I, I think we should have some some understanding of what this is going to cost before we make these decisions. It's it's too much money to be talking about and too big a decision without knowing some facts. Thank you. Mr. Spear, did they give any indication of kind of what, I know that the, the whole model would be completely different because your revenue would be a lot more in a four-story too, right? Um, no, because it's the same same number of units and the same configuration. Just taller? Yeah. Yeah, well, then a three-story probably makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, because if we're doing the same number of units, why would we, why would we amend our whole our whole plan as a municipality of three-story buildings, right? If we're no further ahead. Councilor Allen. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. Um, so my understanding is, is that there are some significant energy efficiencies. I don't disagree that we, we do need some understanding of the cost. Um, 
in, in terms of what it would be as a three-story or what it would be to go up. Um, but, but I did hear them clearly identify the fact that there were significant energy efficiencies and that it did go, it did align with our um, goal as a municipality to be as energy efficient as possible. Um, I also agree in terms of the, um, the look of it. I personally like it staggered. I find it looks far too institutional. The first one look, looks far too institutional. And, and if we want to talk about look and feel, I think we do need to keep that in mind, even if it's <clears throat> on the grounds of the old dump. <laughs> pardon me. But the other thing that, <coughs> pardon me. Okay, we'll stick to the height and do the design. Yeah, but it, with respect to the um, height, one of the things I heard the presenters talk about um, was that if we went up and had a smaller footprint, then we could have a second building if we so chose at some point. And we had talked about that. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Harlan. Anyone else? Councillor Ware. I'll just add one comment. I, I agree we, sh we should look at uh, cost. Back a few decades ago, I was involved in some uh, building projects. Uh, it was always less expensive to go up than it was to go up. And it is more energy efficient because you're tightening it up. But there is a ratio that, you know, 40 years ago it was less expensive to go up than out. I don't know what it is now, but uh, it's a consideration. Thank you. Any other member of council hasn't spoke yet? Councilor Neal. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I'm not opposed to the fourth story. I do agree with Councilor Heenan that would could possibly have a difficult time getting it through where it does I, I, personally it feels like we're somewhat circumventing our own our own plan um, with regards to cost I had mentioned that during the initial meeting that again uh, you know I'd love to see just some initial prices on uh, on you know to help me make a decision with regards to the four story though um, I also question again just um, the safety aspect of it Again, from the local fire department's point of view, again, I know we do have a new truck coming, um, but four stories is also four stories to climb. Um, and my question, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but with regards to building code, I don't know if four stories then requires the standpipes in the stairwells, so you can actually drag hose up and connect as opposed to um, having to take a charged hose line up, which is significantly difficult. Um, so I would have that question for the developer. Again, I don't know if four stories kicks that in or not, but it definitely poses a risk um, when you have to climb that far up to potentially bring people out. Um, so again, I'd just like a little bit more information on that. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. I have uh, no qualms about the four stories, except for that we've turned down buildings of higher and I think we're going to, um, as you say, there will be a precedence, but we're going to have a lot of people that are going to come forward and say, you wouldn't allow my building to be four stories and I had to change my plans. So we have to look at this very carefully, I think, myself. Um, and again, like Councillor Harlan said, uh, the drawings of it being, you know, just a commercial building that doesn't fit into the setting of St. Andrews, um, I would worry about that as well with, with uh, the people of uh, St. Andrews. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so yeah, as far as the, the feasibility and the cost, like right now we're, we're not into any of it. That, that's a major component. What they want is just a feeling of what we want, then they'll come back and say, this is what this will cost. And if council likes it, then we have to go out and essentially find funding partners, other levels of government, to try to make this a reality. Now, if we come back and say that's way too much, then that's when you peel it back a little bit, right? That's you know, typically how it how it goes. Um, but the question of building up versus out, it's a good question. It does change. I know that 
you know, if you talk to some developers, two stories is better because then they don't have to get into an elevator, which is quite expensive and things like that, right? So in that case, going out is what I hear from majority of developers makes sense. But if we're doing a third floor, I assume this has to have an elevator. That, so it's going to have an elevator either way now, right? So, um, but I guess just for the design to get the first costing, um, I've heard a lot of different people give a lot of different views. Um, unless someone has anything new they want to add, um, then I'll try to get a little consensus of what your preference is at this time. Mr. Spear, go ahead. Hey, Your Worship. Probably better to let uh, Mr. Gopin speak to it. But the other night he joined us on that meeting. Or Alex, sorry. That's right, he was on vacation. Sorry, so to put my words into his mouth. <laughs> All those planners. <laughs> anyway, sorry, to get back to it. What Alex was saying at the time was that really the three level restriction has primarily been restricted in the historic business district and that's more to do with their secondary municipal plan than to do with anything within our zoning bylaw what he pointed out was the three stories was loosely arbitrary based on the anchors landing project specifically that nothing of that magnitude had ever been built within the municipality before and so they created an MR2 zone at the time, said, ah, three stories sounds like it'd fit in that location, good, let's do it, without really any type of back history. So you just understand how this three-story limit came to be. And what he's saying is council, you know, in fact, I think he said he'd even create its own zone for something of this magnitude again. And that if you thought the fourth story fit in place, it's less a zoning bylaw issue because there's less within the zoning bylaw that restricts it, that it's a very specific type of property. I'm here, neither here nor there. I just, Alex is trying to get us to not get stuck on this three story options because it's not a hard and written rule in most of the town, except for those that are within the second, that fall under the secondary municipal plan. Thank you, Worship. Your Worship, just one more point on that in regards to legalities of other developers coming in and saying, why didn't you allow me? Uh, Mr. Henderson did note in that meeting that each design and each decision of that is based on council and they can't be, you can't be litigated for making a decision one way or another on it. So each is basically like a PAC is looking at it, each is its own merit based on what it's being presented for that property. Okay. All right. Pack anything else? Okay, how many uh, just for the just to get for the design? How many here would prefer? We'll start with three stories. Uh, hold your hands up, just because there's. And how many would prefer four stories? And how many didn't vote, Mr. Councillor Heenan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so consensus is three stories for design. Now the next one is, Council, very quickly on the on the options. Um, um, I, I, does anyone prefer option one? I can't see. No. Oh, you I do. Like, I like one simply because I know it would be the cheapest, and without them telling me how much it more it's going to cost for the accessories, like to, to bump it out, uh, I, I would want to know roughly what the cost would be, what percentage it would cost to me before I would vote for a more elaborate uh, frontage. We, we did talk about that briefly uh, when the original presentation was done, and, and they did make it sound like there isn't a major cost between option one and option two. I don't have the dollars, that's, but uh, they did indicate that it wasn't a significant increase. Sorry, uh, excuse me, uh, Your Worship. Uh, just, just to kind of debate that just for a second, when we had uh, our tour of the other fine establishment that's being built up the street here, uh, we talked to Gerald about that and he talked about how much every corner costs a lot of money. And he's like, the, the less corners uh, is way less money. You know, straight is, is inherently cheaper than any other option. And he, he's like, to minimize a, a corner saves a lot of money. So, you know, from, from a gentleman who's built at least two of these buildings in our community, or currently building one, um, you know, that's, that's not what he's saying. So maybe we need to speak to somebody who has a little more experience, uh, you know, and, and get a, a real understanding of what this would cost. Like if, it's, if, if the difference is only dollars, it's not a big deal. But if the difference is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, then that is a big deal. Yeah, I, I can't argue back. I'm just going based on what the architecture, uh, the architect told me. Uh, well, I asked the same question. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we can break down 
to get a more, I'm sure that's something they could estimate. I don't think that's like a third, fourth. I think that's something that you could maybe give us a little more indication on. Well, with all due respect, Your Worship, these buildings aren't like way out originals that are just unique to St. Andrews. There'll probably be about 200 of them they've already built in the past. So I'm sure I emailed them. I didn't get a response right now, but you know, I'm sure they can tell us pretty quickly once we get in touch with them what the difference between the options are roughly. You won't know till you actually go to build it, but they can tell us what costs more or not. Councillor Neal, then we'll go Councillor Heenan. Anyone else new? And then we'll go back to you, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. Yeah, on Mr. Spears' note then, um, could we not get some general numbers on these designs? Again, I find like I'm almost handcuffed here trying to trying to pick one option over the other when, again, I have no idea what the cost difference is between these options. Um, and it just feels a little kind of backwards to me to pick an option that we're going to give the developer sort of our okay on and have them go and then potentially go looking for funding partners when we could be shooting ourselves in the foot here. Okay, so based on that, Council, um, if, if we don't want to set our preference tonight and then and then get costs and, and work backwards, then uh, Mr. Spear could meet with them and tell them to give estimates on what the difference is between each design. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Spear? So I don't... I, I, I don't have answers to no, uh, any of these questions. No, I follow Council's lead in this, Your Worship. I think it's going to be minimal, especially we're such at the early, early, early stages <laughs> of this. They're just trying to get, no matter what they tell us, they're still going to be probably 20% off until this thing gets fully designed. You know, they're going on real thumbnail. But I certainly can ask a few questions just to see roughly what their thoughts are and cost differences based on their past experience and uh, in probably percentage terms. And then... Uh, they'll know roughly square footage costs per unit in the building and give us just really rough estimates of total dollar amounts. So we know, you know, if we're talking big dollars or just talking, you know, less than 5% of the project cost. Councillor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship. Um, I agree with um, Councillor Harland. Uh, number one is just never gonna be an option for me because it's too plain. Um, these people, it's their forever home and it, if they're going to be living in it, it has to look and feel like St. Andrews. Number one is far out there, and I would never support it if it was uh, if it was forty thousand dollars more to put it something that made it fall into character of the town. Then I would support that. But number one, it just looks like a row house without anything, and it's too institutionalized, and it would never work for me. I would never back that. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councilor Allen. Um, if we're going to be asking some for some additional information, I wonder if we could um, also ask, just for rough estimates, what the cost is going up versus going out, and the energy savings. Because what I what I did put in my notes from that meeting was that there were significant energy savings. So, Councillor Harlan, on page 28 of your um, package, where it says building form efficiency study, a right. four-story tall building would be, the, and the three-story were 5,030 meters squared. Uh, the four-story would actually have a 15% less built area, so you would actually be seeing a, a reduction in size and, and energy efficiency within that. That says 15% less? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Gubishaw. Nothing, nothing really to add that's new, Your Worship. Just, just to remind everyone that in our last uh, kick at the uh, municipal plan, we asked the planners to, to look at ways that we could densify our community, which put more people into, into the space. And uh, adding a fourth floor, like in this instance, um, keeps the building from sprawling out. Um, if it's the same cost relative, um, I would think that we, we need to look at densifying our community, like adding... Uh, adding uh, on suites above garages, that sort of thing. We've been in favor of that. So I, I don't understand why we would balk at having a, a four story in this particular location. I mean, it's not downtown, it's up down in by the, uh, by the lagoon um, and behind the college. It's the perfect place for having a four story and not sprawling out and, at, and, uh, and being uh, uh, taking up space that, that might be good for having an, an adjacent park or parking or a, a secondary building. So um, just putting that out there. Thank, Thank you, Your Worship. Appreciate it. I, I, I did get consensus on the height, though. It, right now it's design. Um, 
And uh, I just, yeah, just try to keep it moving forward, as I'm sure you can all appreciate based on the previous two meetings we've had together. Um, so uh, over to you, Council. We can get costs and come back. Uh, to me, between option two and option three, option two actually fits the shape of the NBCC. It doesn't really have those triangular uh, kind of tops to it that look like, the, to your point, they add cost. Um, so option two seems to blend in nicely with what the existing building is right in front of it. That's just the way that, that I see it. But um, maybe if, if staff could even take it back and say, what is the difference in total project cost roughly? If they could give us any numbers, it might help council have more consensus. But um, I, I guess just for the sake of getting to them with their preference and then them coming back and showing us the savings, uh, we, we do have one council that prefers option one, not knowing the cost. Uh, between, between the rest of council, is there a preference between option two or three? How many prefer option two? Can, can I just weigh yep. in before we start Absolutely. here? And I, I do want to say, like, uh, to me, there's one clear uh, uh, rendition that is much nicer than the rest, and that's, that's with the gable front. And I do agree that that is absolutely the nicest front. And I'm happy to say, you know, I'd be willing to throw my support behind that uh, design by by far if there's no nominal increase in 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 uh, uh, bill cost. So once you find out that information, I'd be happy for us to vote on that based on the fact that there not be a significant increase in the cost. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reddit. So between option two and option three, just for preference, we're not signing into anything today, Council, right? Like it's not, this isn't the design. Like it's, they're just looking for an idea to keep moving ahead, get more accurate costing. And then part of it would be what the alternatives, uh, uh, Mr. Spear. Sorry, Worship, but a couple of the councillors want, you've asked me for uh, questions to be answered by the architect. So instead of changing our mind in two weeks, why don't you just leave it with me and after Perfect. the July meeting, I would be we'll rediscuss to. this. This is what I get for being away Wednesday night or last week. Um, thank you for the frustration, everyone. We will just uh, table that for this particular time. Uh, next uh, motion, please. So, Council, you're on page 31 of your package. It's another Council discussion. Oh, thank please. you. Over to you. Thank you, Your Worship. So the, uh, I'm just going to summarize the background staff report. So uh, a new owner on, on O'Neill Farm Road um, is experiencing some flooding in the bottom corner of his property. Uh, I've supplied you some, some mapping of, of the property. What becomes a bit of an issue is that, as we know, O'Neill Farm Road itself is actually part of a homeowners association and not a public roadway. And so the work itself has to be done within their, their property. Uh, the, the owner asserts that he thinks that there's some things that the town has done that has caused the flooding. Staff doesn't necessarily agree with them. And as you saw within the report, we had an engineer came down and just did a high level study, came down, took some measurements, did some visual looks and provided some recommendations and that the part of the problem has been is that when the culvert was put in, it wasn't put in at a enough angle to divert the water down. Like the, the, as he, the engineer says that there has to be a fairly substantial amount of water to push the water to, instead of you know other culverts that are say at a two or three percent grade, the water would just flow naturally. And then the other problem is on the other side of the road. So if you're driving up O'Neill Farm Road, past the cul-de-sac on the right-hand side where that main culvert is we're talking about. It's kind of a marshy area that is substantially filled with vegetation. And so that is causing the um, water flow to, to restrict even more, that that really has to be dug out and, and rechanneled. And there's a 30-meter th buffer before it gets into the uh, wetland areas, like the official wetland designated areas, as the province says. So we, there's probably some work could be done there, but it's going to be a big job just because we aren't entirely sure how a excavator, one of our own backhoes couldn't do the job because our arms wouldn't be reached enough. They'd pull into that area and sink up to, their, up to the cabin. So it's going to require more specialty equipment than us. And so for the work that's been done up there most recently, it's mostly related to the trail and some ditching and stuff. But uh, again, from our looking at it, there doesn't seem to be any indication that that's really been the cause. 
there's no doubt that there's water kind of pooling, but it's at a at the very bottom end of the slope, and the whole property kind of has two or three properties that on the side of a hill that are all gradually coming down here. So as you know, we've had the tremendous amount of rains over the last year or so, and that's probably part of it. And so we're just waiting for instruction from you on, on how you'd like to address it from a, you know, um, I'm not sure that even the homeowners association hasn't directly come to us. It was through this specific landowner, and so maybe you know if there should be a partnership or something, we should have the whole association talk with us. But I'm just looking for direction from you to determine if you have questions, but if you want to entertain this or if it's really back to the homeowners or if you need more information to make a decision. It has been going on for over a year or so, but. Again, with the amount of water we've had and with this vegetation growing in even on the property, it tends to retain the water, as you know. So as you get thick grass and certain types of bushes, it holds the water and the ground underneath gets more wet and exasperates the problem. We walked it last week and there was no pooling of water. I think he talked about that there was ducks on his property at one point, but there wasn't that much water. If there was, if there were ducks, they were walking last weekend. They weren't swimming in, on the property. So I'm just not entirely sure where to go here. For now, our policy has not been to go on private property and uh, even reinstate that, that, you know, if it was a public road and we had to go on private property, we'd, the recommendation would be that they participate in hiring a contractor just because if there's future problems you don't necessarily want to be tied into the construction methods of our public works crew and so we're just trying to figure out what the best avenue to follow for this landowner is so just in summary then it's a it's private land and CBCL's looked at it and said they don't believe there's anything the municipality has done to cause the flooding and staff's recommendation would be not to uh, take on the responsibility of mitigating this? Certainly not with our equipment. So if we were, if council felt the desire to mitigate, it would be by a financial contribution so that they could get their own contractors to do the work and provide them direction as they see fit. Yeah, I can feel for the, uh, for the landowner, but in the same sense, I think a duck in that area is quite common because it is right beside the salt marsh, right? So, uh, Councilor Ware. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, totally with staff's recommendation. It's a precedent we shouldn't sit, you know, shouldn't set. Uh, the other thing is with the expanded municipality, there's many of us with driveways that long. As Councilor Bennett said when he drove me home last night, uh, last week, God, you live a long ways up here in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think it's precedent we shouldn't set. Uh, the other thing is with these waterways, again, in a previous life, I helped design water wheels for sawmills, and it was the outflow that was just as important as the inflow to make sure that the water could clear away at the other end of the culvert as opposed to the end it was going into. To go out and have it nice and clear where it's going out. As far as the ducks, I used to have ducks in my back lawn every year in, in Bathurst. They were there for two weeks, gone. That was it. <laughs> so. Thank you. I see your hand, Councillor Neal. Uh, yep. I'll go to you, Councillor Heaton, after that. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I went down and looked at this actually this afternoon, and uh, just to note on that culvert, I mean, there might be a puddle of water in front of it. Um, I don't see anything that the town would have done ditching Salt Marsh Road or anything, how it would be contributing to that. Uh, the clearing that the homeowner indicated he did to me is actually contributing to the problem. Um, again, we all know trees like to soak up moisture. Um, so I think he's actually added to the problem there. But I think the real thing for me anyway that kind of sets this apart is basically what we're being asked to do is get involved in moving water from one private lot onto another private lot, which the other side of that culvert goes right into another private lot. And I think it's important to note that uh, the first couple houses along there are not part of that HOA. Um, they didn't participate in it. So 
it's not, I didn't necessarily get the impression, but reading the letter, it sounded like the HOA was kind of together in this. Um, and I think we would probably have uh, some letters coming our way from the homeowner that he wants to divert the water to um, if we got involved in this. So thank you. Councilor Hayden. Yes, Your Worship, to echo uh, Councillor Neal's point, I wanted to know where the water would go, and I figured where, I kind of figured where it was going to go. And the other thing is, uh, there was a lot of clear cutting done, and once again, it has to do with the trees not saturating up the water. And three, I have ducks floating on my lawn on Power Street when there's enough rain so i'm just saying it's it's not it's not common to have ducks floating on your lawn so i i agree with the report from the engineer and i do think that uh, if we took action then we'd always be liable for any work thank you thank you councillor Heenan. any other member of council i think we said council Harlan. thank you mayor henderson so i um have to make a decision based on what, based on the report from CBCL and based on the, the report from staff. I'm comfortable with um, the recommendations that have been made. I, fear, I feel for the homeowner. I can appreciate that it's a challenge, but I don't believe that we have um, uh, liability in this situation and I'm not comfortable in setting a precedent. I think we're going to be seeing lots of um, property issues with the change in, in climate con as, it, as we continue to experience the changes in climate, and I think that's going to be a never-ending story. So I'm just not comfortable with us um, weighing in on that at this time. Perfect. I think I have consensus, but um, all in favor of the recommendation by staff and CBCL? Yeah, see, that's, thank you. Anyone else? So I didn't want to cut it off short. All right, thank you, Council. Um, the next one would be on page 37, and I believe it is Councillor Neal, isn't it? Yeah. You have to re read that entire grid, eh? <laughs> Bear with me, then. <laughs> so this is PWPS 240610. And it is the request to Minister of Natural Resources and Energy Development for permission to conduct the 2024 nuisance deer hunt. Uh, the background reads, as part of the process for the nuisance deer hunt, the Town of St. Andrews must formally request permission to host the hunt from the Minister of Natural Resources and Energy Development. The goal of the program in partnership with DNRED is to lower the number of deer safely within the urban limits of town. Hunting can only occur with the use of a bow and must be on a property with one acre or greater of space. The number of available permits will be determined by DNRED. Uh, the deer hunt again allows private landowners within the urban town limits to receive special permits authorizing hunters to harvest antlerless deer on their property. Hunters and landowners can register with the town between September 1st and October 31st and the hunt takes place between October and November. Um, do you want me to keep going with the stats there? No, it's okay. <laughs> so the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews moves to request permission from the province, Provincial Minister of Natural Resources and Energy Development for approval for the 2024 nuisance deer hunt within the town of St. Andrews, and I so move. Seconder for that one. I've got uh, Councillor Bennett. Discussion? Councillor Bennett. Yes, I would just like to clarify that this indeed includes Bayside and Shamcook in this request. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, the background and, and staff has known that they will be requesting it again. Ultimately, it'll be the minister's decision, but I can follow up with the minister to find out why one area is and why the other isn't um, for clarification on it further in the future. Thank you. That would be very greatly appreciated. And the good news is uh, not one political party or the other, but Minister Holland obviously has a, a, a long background of, of being in the woods and himself being a hunter, so he's probably the right person to really explain the uh, the reasoning one way or another. Councillor Ware. Yes, I understand why the, the people in, in town want the nuisance hunt. I don't classify any animal as nuisance. 
but uh, out in the rural areas, we live out there because we enjoy wildlife. Uh, I had two bucks with uh, their horns and velvet on my lawn last night. Took numerous pictures and sit and watch them for a half hour. And uh, I am a class one licensed guide, so I, I am capable of hunting. I do for once every 20 years, but uh, uh, I don't think when we agree to live or we make the decision to live in the country that we can call deer and bears and raccoons and all of these animals nuisance. They were there before us. I, uh, I take the approach, and I know the history of the indi indigenous people on the plains far better than I do in the eastern part of the continent, but they lived one with the land and the animals. If they had to harvest an animal for food, they gave thanks to whatever deity they respected. And uh, obviously, I, I'm not an avid environmentalist, but I am an animal lover. And uh, it's, I realize Accidents happen. There were a lot of deer when I was growing up. We didn't use car seats. We didn't use seat belts. And here I am sitting alive. So, uh, just the way it is. And uh, I don't think I've talked to people of Bayside. Some suggest get rid of those deer. They're into my flower gardens. And the majority seem to accept it. Thank you very much. Council Harlan. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. So I just um, would uh, like to respond to Councillor Weir's comments. For me, um, this, I, I will struggle <laughs> if Shamcook and Bayside are not included in this um, request. Uh, because that gives people permission to either choose to participate in the cull or not to choose. And I would have a hard time understanding if we are all one happy community, why um, uh, parts of our community don't have that right to be able to participate in the cull if they so chose. I, I've had a fair number of people comment to me about this and they want to be able to choose whether or not they participate. And I'm really hoping that it will come out with a positive um, uh, affirmation that we will all participate. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Harlan. Councillor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship, uh, to comment to uh, Councillor Weir. Uh, Darwin said it right when he said survival of the fittest. Um, I believe that if we let the deer go, uh, they will face extinction. Um, there's not enough resources around to keep deer uh, multiplying and multiplying without a cull. Um, cull is probably another factor of the evolutionary chain, I guess. Uh, I just worry uh, the few biology courses I did take also says that if you let, a, if you let things run wild without a predator, then they become extinct. So I believe the cull is necessary. Whether you agree with it or not, I still think it's a necessary thing that we have to do simply because of the fact that they're overpopulating our peninsula. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just a, a couple comments on, on what I heard. So um, yeah, I, I definitely see kind of a lot of different variables going this. So in order for the old St. Andrews to have a nuisance deer hunt, there was years of data collection that was counting the deer by DNR, so they are able to prove the population increased. That could be a hindrance for, for Shamcook Bayside. I don't know. Maybe they do have the numbers. Maybe they don't. Um, but if, at the very least, we get a no, it would be good to start trying to get estimates of there to see if it's growing. Uh, I will say that the nuisance hunt actually uh, does not really diminish the population of deer in St. Andrews, anyone that's seen it for enough years, but it does help keep it in check. Um, but what happens is if those deer, those white-tailed deer, um, the ones that they put in the province where they put the neck tags around them that actually tracks them, 
it clearly shows that a lot of deer, and it goes against what I knew growing up, but a lot of those deer migrate up to 70 kilometers a year. They do return into one area, but they will move around. So it's very possible that when you look at the municipality after the nuisance hunt, you feel like there's less deer, but between migration and uh, reproduction, it kind of replenishes the population every year. Deer naturally, in an environment has a carrying capacity. If it gets overpopulated, deer naturally will get pushed out. And that's what we're actually seeing. It seems like every spring we're getting a young moose that will, a bull moose that'll come into town. Typically they're looking to establish its territory, its own uh, feeding ground. Uh, it's possible a bigger moose moves it out. Deer, deer not to the same extent, but are, are very similar. So um, I do think that um, what we could always do is, is take it to the province, get their word and then discuss it further. Cause I believe even if we did, we would have the option of adjusting that ourselves after I believe would we not. Mr. Spear? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I so if Shamcook Bayside were it deemed included in this program, would council still have the opportunity before it's implemented to re revisit that? Again, there it's, is all within, it, it's all within DNR's scope. Scope. Okay. It's, um, and we may have questions because those property owners that have larger than normal, like three or four acres, may be able to participate in their own hunt outside of the St. Andrews area. The, uh, I they have definitely to are. They definitely yeah. are, but they are limited to the hunters being allowed to take one uh, antlered uh, deer, so buck. Uh, and then as far as antlerists, they have to apply to the province as part of provincial draw, and they could get one tag, but it's specific to the draw, not to the individual property, which is different than the nuisance hunt. Councilor Ware? I'll just make a follow-up on that, where you did bring up the draw for the antlerless deer. There's very few of those licenses passed out. And it, uh, true, it's done by wildlife zones, and this is wildlife zone 22, which is fairly large. But they only give a few uh, antlered or antlerless deer license. And, uh, you know, if they want to cut down on the number of does, all they've got to do is increase the number of people they get those licenses, but they don't change it from year to year by very small amounts. Oh, you are correct. Uh, well, surprisingly, the applicants are, are fairly low too, though, uh, which is really surprising to, to that point. Um, so yeah, the, the program would be different. It would be if, if you had a farm, and I have talked to a, a gentleman that has a farm at Bayside, and he's quite frustrated by deer as well. Um, in that case, he would probably get anywhere from probably 10 to 20 tags based on the what happens in the town. Uh, and those can be used uh, for uh, both bucks and antlers, so does. Um, so, yeah, it does change the, the program and the hunting quite significantly. I will say another thing the province, in fairness to them, has to weigh out is they understand we have challenges, but in the same sense, there's a lot of other areas in the province, and we don't need to get into that, that don't have enough deer, right? So it's really it's a really hard balance game for them, for sure. So, Council, uh, is there any more debate on this? Okay, I will call the question then. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. Um, abstain means it's not a nay, right, Mr. Knopper? So, okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, well, then we'll hand it over to you then, Councillor Ware. So through you, your worship, the, the change that would happen to the, um, to Schedule B of uh, 2301, the Tourism Accommodation Levy, instead of it saying the Tourism Accommodation Levy Board, which is the Committee of Council of the Town, the change would be to explore St. Andrews being that named party within that. So the town under the bylaw does have to select a tourism provider to, sh to do the marketing promotion. It would, it, it's the same group doing the same thing, just under a new name and their own bylaws. 
The difference is maybe running as a not-for-profit organization versus under the town system as it is right now. So yes, we would meet the, the conditions for the change in the bylaw. So, but we haven't approved the, the conditions well, the, the condition that is being provided to you, Your Worship, uh, is that you were to review their bylaws and if you were comfortable, because you, you don't actually get a way in on their bylaws. That they What was recommended was you. this has been vetted through lawyers, this has gone through the process, they have a business number, they are registered in the province of New Brunswick as a not-for-profit organization, they've met all the standards to be a not-for-profit group, they have approved these as themselves as a board. It was recommended that they come to council for you guys to review, and if you're okay, to proceed with the with the recommended motions that are here before you. I'm not I'm not comfortable making the motion. Sure. Okay, Councillor Ware, would anyone else like to bring Councillor Hino and bring this forward, and then we can debate it to your point, Councillor Ware. Thank you, Your Worship. It's EBC two four zero six zero six. Ad hoc tourism promotion committee rescind and approval of Explore St. Andrews. The background is Explore St. Andrews has completed its bylaws and has established itself as a nonprofit organization in the province of New Brunswick. With this establishment, they have requested the, that the ad hoc tourism promotion committee be rescinded and, the, and that Explore St. Andrews be added as a tourism partner under bylaw. 23-01, Tourism Accommodation Levy. Staff recommend this change to both Bylaw 2301 to close out the ad hoc committee and to establish uh, Explore St. Andrew as the tourism partner. Note that before Council approves the changes, the Council review and understand the new operating bylaws of Explore St. Andrews. The action is motion that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews rescinds the Ad Hoc Tourism Promotion Committee. I so move this, Your Worship. Thank you. Can I have a seconder to get it on the table? I've got Deputy Mayor Akerji. Now we're open to discussion. Um, I guess I'll just open it to the floor first. Okay, Deputy Mayor Akerji. So what we are saying is that the Ad Hoc Committee would be gone, and this is changing the name, and they're accepting the bylaws as stated by that group before the ad hoc committee correct so we created the ad hoc tourism promotion committee because they didn't have all their ducks in a row out of right. the gate they had a we they're almost a subcommittee and the expectation was that they would once they got their own status then at that point they would become their own entity um and i'll say that the bylaws that are attached are their own bylaws Technically, we're not approving them. Um, I think we wanted to see them to make sure they were there and that they were operating with bylaws. Um, myself, um, just on that, um, it's not a fault of theirs. It's a fault of our bylaw that we have for them. Is I think we have a major gap in this community. Explore St. Andrew's job is to market and to attract. The chamber is saying that their role is not just to tourism. It's to all business, and they're trying to step back a little from tourism. The municipality ourselves, we don't have the personnel in place so there's a huge gap in this community right now where we're attracting visitors but no one's taking ownership for their experience once they're here so okay. uh, again that's not their fault um, that's our own bylaw of how we set them up because it clearly says the way that their by the way that their bylaws are it lines up with what our bylaws are that we've set for them okay. so that's a really long explanation of it it's on us more than anyone i think okay. Councilor, thank you yeah, I'll make uh, just a couple comments. Uh, nowhere in, in the bylaws does it talk about the uh, VIC, and I guess they absolve themselves of responsibility for it. The chamber's trying to absolve themselves of responsibility for it, and it's a, probably one of the most visible things that we have in town with respect to tourism on a daily basis. With respect to their bylaws, uh, I went through them, and there's several things here that are misleading or erroneous. I don't know what would be the word to use. I, I guess I can't find the proper word, but uh, it's just inconsistencies. I guess I'll use that word. And uh, 
So I don't know when we say we approve the changes, I guess we're not talking about proving their bylaws. And it says the council review and understands the new operating bylaws of Explorer St. Andrews. Well, does council, uh, has council reviewed and do they understand these bylaws? I guess that's my question. So. I, I, in fairness, I think we could probably ask that for any motion with a background. Um, I, I hear your point. Um, however, technically speaking, the background's the background, the motion's the motion. It, again, it is their bylaws. I hope council has reviewed them. That's why they're in this package. I'd hope they've reviewed the entire package. Um, but uh, to the level of understanding, I guess only each individual councillor can answer that for themselves, right? So, Councillor Harlan. So, and just to clarify, uh, there are some outstanding issues, the VIC being one of them, but that needs that requires further discussion with Explore St. Andrews, with the Chamber. We, we have to have some discussion around that, but that is all outside of the scope of this particular motion. This is simply, well, not simply, but this is about changing their name and becoming a, um, an, a their own entity. Right. Correct. So you don't approve this, they would still technically be an ad hoc committee right. of the town of St. Okay. Andrews doing the good. exact same thing. I'm good. Yeah. Mr. Spear. Uh, just a reminder to council is that both the clerk and I are ad hoc, not ad hoc, um, ex officio members of the board. So we're involved in their day to day. And I can tell you on their first order of business, they said we have to look at the VIC, that they understand that it's in a gray area for this year, that the town uh, took it on just so it wouldn't be. Uh, mothballed so it would continue but they know they have to take an active role in figuring out the future of that as sooner rather than later and, and we preach it to them every time we have it that you know budget time sneaking up on us fast and all that and so if they don't see value in it they have to let us know but they also know that the bylaws that establishes the tourism accommodation levy and in fact this board and the funding can be revisited by council too, depending on their views of the VIC and, and their vision of what those funding is for. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, and just on, the, on that question, I, I do think that kind of like any bylaw, especially that's new, is we do have to review that and say, how's it going, what's working, what's not. Naturally, the way it was done, there was one of those things where you had to implement something, but there's been some time for some key learning. And it's, <laughs> as long as I've been on council, which has been eight years, the visitor information center every year seems like it's kind of in limbo or in, it, it, every year there's a discussion on it. So it'd be good to have some type of, uh, some, some type of uh, consistent plan for it versus this year to year that continues to happen. So I would wrap that up in it as well. And council, just to be clear, uh, when you go to review that bylaw, you could make it as a stipulation that they have to run a visitor information center. You do have that within the authority if they want to receive this money money they have to run it or you could say it's their decision uh, it's completely up to you so councillor bennett thank you your worship uh i understand where councillor weir is coming from and i guess uh i'd like to say that my understanding was when this came in front of us that we were going to see those changes uh, i guess i wasn't aware that now it's on us to change our bylaw for them not to change their bylaw so I do understand where you're coming from because I was really expecting to see some of those changes, including the, the Visitor Information Center. But, uh, and I'm fine with proceeding on what we have here, but I would ask that maybe we could ask staff to bring that in front of us sooner rather than later before money's dispersed uh, for the next coming season, if that would be possible. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councilor. But my recommendation would be kind of right after peak season to get into this because you're going to want some engagement from the people too like that are members of this it's kind of a two-way street and hitting them with this at july i don't think it's very fair to them in august because this is like the time where they really make money so my recommendation would be october and then we've got several months before we actually uh have to make a decision mr spear and just a reminder to your worship is that uh, Explore St. Andrews just reformed their new organization and there's several new players in it. So we'd have to give them at least a few months to get their feet wet so we can see the numbers for this year and they can begin to form an opinion. If we ask them right now, they just say, we don't know, we get to see how things are going. It should be brought up too though that they 
contribute a significant portion, two thirds or better of their funding for this year to run the visitor information center. So they're a key financial partner. We just took on uh, the onus of, of making sure it was staffed and, and getting the things in place and rehabilitating that space to be at it. But they're still a financial, significant financial contributor to the VIC. It's just, uh, especially the chamber not necessarily wanting to run it and then them reforming this new organization with most of the previous members gone and a whole bunch of new slate of directors. It was really a hard year to continue that without uh, council stepping in to ensure that we had at least one more center at the VIC. Councilor Harlan. Um, I would agree that um, the timing is not right. They're going into their busy season. I would agree that um, fall, mid to late fall, is probably a better time to have this discussion. But can we have like a collaborative um, uh, planning session around this? I, I, I mean, I, I know that it's a large, it's a number of people in terms of the board, the, the um, Explore St. Andrews board and the council. But um, I really think that my preference would be to to be able to put some things on the table and have some discussion and come away with some agreed upon um, direction. Yeah, I think that's something that they would welcome actually. So I, I, this environment, no, like, you know, I mean them sitting there and then, uh, but like a work session, sit down and make it optional for any counselor that wishes to be involved. I, I don't think we all have to be, but if someone wants to be, I think they should have, a counselor should have the right to provide some feedback for them and also like to, to give them a, Gives them a little bit of heads up if we are going to change our bylaw where some of the councillors thoughts are at as well. Sorry, uh, Your Worship, just to note, uh, we have just released out the municipal plan survey and we are gaining feedback from the public and one of the key, one of the main ones that's coming out as feedback is regulation of Airbnb. So this comes back to your bylaw anyways and should be reviewed because you're going to hear it from the municipal plan review. So um, mid, uh, you know, a, a, a mid fall discussion on this will give you a lot more information on multiple avenues for that bylaw and what you might want to change or, or modify at that time. Thank you. No one else? Okay, I will call the question then for the first motion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, carried. Next motion. Thank you, Worship and Council. Motion that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews approves Explore St. Andrews as the tourism partner under bylaw 2301 Tourism Accommodation Levy. I so move. Seconder, please. I've got Councillor Bennett. Discussion? Probably same as the last one. All in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That's been carried. We are now uh, moving ahead to page 50, which would be Councillor Blanchard, who's not here. Um, hmm. Who would like to read this? Open floor. All right, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Your Worship. Reference number RE240608, submitted for Councillor Blanchard. Subject request for Food Forest Memorandum of Understanding. And the background reads, at the 240603 regular council meeting, Rika Nason of the Food Forest Initiative Committee presented a proposal for a food forest at PID 1502975 at the corner of Acadia Road and Champlain Avenue. This is a 1.6 acre lot designated green space and owned by the Town of St. Andrews. A food forest is a sustainable method of growing food and increasing the productivity of growing space Reducing, reduces maintenance efforts year after year, year over year, sorry, excuse me. Decreases the need for annual inputs, increase, uh, increases habit uh, benefits for insects, and gives people a green space to gather and enjoy nature. The goal is to create a sustainable mini ecosystem that supports increased food production for the open door program and any member of the public. The Food Forest Initiative Committee is comprised of multiple stakeholders, including the Open Door Food Program, St. Andrews Community Garden, Indigenous Peoples, nonprofit groups, local farmers, I'm not even sure how to pronounce that, permaculturalists, landscape architects, community members, local business owners, and uh, anticipating uh, the town of St. Andrews. They have requested use of the land noted and uh, looking for support from the town in the form of a memorandum of understanding to take the next steps in the development of the food forest for the community. And the motion reads, 
that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews supports the development of a food forest at PID 150-29275, a 1.6 acre lot at the corner of Arcadia Road and Champlain Avenue, owned by the Town of St. Andrews, and direct staff to create a memorandum of understanding for use of the land for the food forest initiative under the terms and conditions established by the Chief Administrating Officer, and I so move. Seconder, please, Councillor Neal. Discussion? Deputy Mayor Akaji. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. I'd like to thank Rick and Asim for all her work and efforts towards this. She's been working on it with the Council and Council representatives and staff to bring this forward and, and, uh, to, and continues to volunteer and to work due diligence uh, getting this forward. So I think it's a great initiative and I support her and I'd like to thank her for all her efforts. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. R R Rick Nason does deserve a lot of credit. She's kind of the, the moving force behind it and put a lot of time and, and sweat and tears into it. So it's certainly uh, appreciated by everybody. Um, Councilor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship. First, I think this is great. I think this is the best thing. Uh, I was so impressed by this. I think it's a wonderful initiative by all parties involved. The only thing I would ask about the in the memorandum of understanding is at some point we may, as a town, need this land for something, which means that you know we may have to rescind it. My point is I don't want to see it done during the growing season. Like if we were to say that that we needed that land for a specific use, I wouldn't want it to interrupt the growing season. So. If it was going to have to be rescinded, it should be done in the fall or early spring, not during the growing season. That would be just, it just to, it's just to be a nice. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. It is designated green space, is that correct? So I can't, I think it's pretty safe to assume. Yeah. If it was ever rescinded, I would got to assume it would be permanently, which I think would have a little bit of pushback. Even without that, it's still green space that would be taking away. Any other member? Okay, call the question. All in favor of the last motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. That's been carried. Nothing under new business. Question period. Is there anyone online this evening, Mr. Knobber? The audience looks good. The Your Worship, nobody's online and I've received nothing via email. All right, that moves us right ahead to councillors and deputy mayor's comments. Any member of council? Council Harlan. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. I just wanted to say um, a shout out to the organizing committee for the Charlotte County Pride Week activities. There was, it was um, a great menu of activities, but a special shout out to the staff at the Ross Memorial Library who did a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, video uh, in honor of Pride Week. So great, great job. Thank you, Councilor Harlan. Councilor Heenan. Yes, Your Worship. Just a point I'd like to I'd like Council to ponder, and um, Councilor Gumishell will probably be happy when I say this. Um, there's something I really don't understand: is that people who own businesses, and I'm not I'm not pointing anyone out, that have parking off street, they park their vehicle right in front of their establishment, and it stays there for the whole day. I I don't understand that way of thinking because of the fact that they're taking up like sometimes two parking spaces for clients of themselves. And if they have off, off street parking, I don't understand why they don't use it because it will free up space for other people to come in and enjoy their business. Uh, I see it all the time in my walks downtown. And I just, it's just something like when you've been in retail for a lot of years that I just don't understand. Anyway, that's just my two cents worth. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Heenan. Any other member of council? Deputy Mayor. You sometimes oversee me. So um, I'd like to, what? Oh. Do you want to go first, Councillor Weir? You go ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Your Worship, I just wanted to ask if any progress had been made on talking to DTI about the shoulders of the roads on 127. Uh, 
They don't seem to be getting any better. In fact, we know they're getting worse to the point where I wouldn't want to be driving a small vehicle and, and go off the road in a lot of places. I'd actually go down and grade the end of my driveway so I didn't flip the motorcycle when I went out on the highway. So uh, I'm just wondering, we having any success with them? or No success. They've been informed, but I'll ask for a meeting with the local uh, superintendent of the for this region out of St. Stephen and see if we can get a, a timeline for these things. But they tend, as you know, for my history, is about once every five years they'll do like major maintenance along one highway. And we're probably getting close to do, but I don't know if we're five years out or not. But I'll reach out to them because Councillor Bennett has also brought up some issues about some of the secondary roads on vegetation and ditching that needs to be addressed. So I think it's time we have a sit down with them and find out um, what our new residents can expect for um, upkeep of the road, considering they're paying 41 and a half cents towards that upkeep. Well, I guess the reason I asked the question is if, if the old LSD has to do it, we'll do it. But somebody has to talk to DTI. We talked about this back the first of April. I thought a meeting was going forward. Here we are approaching the end of June, still nothing. and. Uh, I'm sure Councillor Bennett uh, feels the same way about it. it uh, we need some, we, if we have to, we'll do it ourselves, but uh, uh, I don't think we should have to. Yeah, um, I would uh, definitely encourage, if you have to do it yourself, I'd encourage any resident that actually is concerned to write um, to the province and to uh, Minister Kathy Bacchus and let her know. I know Councillor Gumichel sent a, a letter of his concerns over the road and it did have a response. So um, straight up, any resident that would like to write about their road conditions, I would strongly recommend it. Um, I have seen the, uh, the file that Andrew Anderson Mason posted on social media and the amount of requests versus what they're allocated for budget. It was a fraction of the work that was requested and backlogged. So if you want to go up with the priority, the more vocal that you are uh, definitely would help. Um, I have no problem, Mr. Spear, sitting in on a meeting. Um, and I think probably the complaints that are in Shamcook Bayside are probably shared around all of southern New Brunswick right now, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't take too far to drive down the streets and see in, in the roads and see the condition that a lot of these are in. But um, on the point like that, we can certainly meet. Um, from my understanding, with based on uh, uh, MLA uh, Anderson Mason, is um, she submits a list as well of things that she's heard in the riding. So um, lobbying there is definitely an encouraged uh, option as well. Because um, I hear you, you're not wrong. Um, and uh, I will say that um, my, it's an assumption, but uh, we used to get a percentage of funds, the old municipality for Highway 127 as it was a provincial road. We haven't received a dollar in over four years now. Um, so that's probably a pretty good indication of the other uh, section of 127 and the neighboring roads as well. I think they've been significantly cut because I know ours, ours of the old uh, funds that we get. Um, we got a, a letter that uh, basically said that we wouldn't be getting anything for five years, I believe, at one point. But every year they ask us to resubmit our plan. So um, I feel your frustration. But, uh, Mr. Spear, if I can help you and in, in asking for them to sit down and explain kind of what their asset management plan is. We have one in the municipality. If someone asks when their road's getting done, it doesn't necessarily mean that's when it's going to get done. But we can grab the file to say it's due in four years, it's due in 17 years. Um yeah, so hopefully they have such a document that they'd be able to provide some insight for us. I know that when we were talking about the lobster holding facility, they were able to tell us that there was no plans in the next X, Y, Z. So perhaps we can get a little more clarity if it is one, two, three years away or, or you know, to your point, tomorrow, ideally. A hundred percent, but I, I don't want to go to the gray area. It's just, unfortunately, we, we can't manage that because they take all the money. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Akadu. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and sorry, Councillor Ware, that I butted in in front of you. Um, a few things I'd like to say. Um, uh, the Earth Fest that Minister's Island hosted with all the people that participated in it, Muriel Jarvis was one of the organizers it was a fantastic day ministers island uh, thank you for 
hosting it again this year it was fabulous i think they had over 500 and some people so it was really a very good day the father's day run on sunday um the mayor got a lot of prizes i don't know how that happened top finisher on town council uh, yeah so and uh i don't know how councillor neil doesn't get in front of you um but <laughs> neither did councillor gubish or councillor hurdle yeah. anyway, first uh -huh. anyway it was a great day too and uh, i'd like to thank all the volunteers that helped out that day it was phenomenal um sharon mcglattery lee um Lee Sokaski, they were co-organizers, but the Kiwanis Club was very involved with helping and assisting, and it was a fantastic day. They had a real good day for it. Uh, you couldn't have asked for better weather, no bugs, no, you know, no rain, no, it wasn't that cold. It was fantastic, so I thank them for that. There's a couple of things that are coming up. Graduation at SJDA um, will be coming up uh, this week, June 21st. Uh, is National uh, Indigenous Day and the Beskatoma um, uh tribe is is hosting a day from 9 till 3 on their poster it's on our site and uh, they're having activities like drumming um, uh, food uh, cultural awareness so that will be all day long in the Market Square in St. Andrews New Brunswick uh, so please c come out and enjoy the day of activities that they have provided for us. Um, I think it'll be a good, t it'll be hopefully pay for good weather like we had today and, and yesterday, and it'll be a phenomenal day. But it's happening in Market Square. The graduation for NBCC is June 27th, which is next week. So congratulations to all their graduates that will be graduating. And as I said, SJDA, their graduates, congratulations to you. And um, I think that's basically it. So thank you very much um, for participating and look forward to the days that are coming soon, like Canada Day. Um, that has been posted on our website and there are a lot of activities. And thanks to Mervyn um, Hanselpecker because he's been doing a lot of uh, reaching out and doing works as well as um, providing things on the weekend. They're gonna. He's um, after Canada Day. There will also be some activities on the weekend. One of them that we hope to do is drumming with um, Sebastian Rhodes. So um, just trying to coordinate those things. But Mervyn is always there. He's helping out. And um, I know it's his job, but he goes above and beyond. It, and uh, he's very welcoming for our town. So thank you very much, Mervyn. And thank you, staff, because you support them. And... and uh, and our boys that keep working hard, especially on Canada Day, I know I worked with them, and they're phenomenal. So thank you very much. And Council, I hope that you're out there on Canada Day, as most of you are. I see you uh, from sunup to sundown, uh, even to the fireworks. So uh, I think we have the best fireworks. So thanks again to the fire department, because you do that, Councillor Neal and uh, um, Kevin Terrio. Uh, your group is phenomenal with our fireworks. So again, thank you very much for a beautiful Canada Day that's going to come. Thank you, Your Worship, for allowing me to talk. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, and just uh, you, obviously, the the Father's Day race. I do want to give uh, Mike Power certainly a shout out because uh, you mentioned a few volunteers. Mike Power certainly uh, is the person that works on it months in advance as well and deserves a lot of credit. So thanks for. Uh, acknowledging all those different community groups. Uh, so I will at this point skip myself and go right into closed session. So at uh, 8.07 p.m., I'm looking for council to go into closed ses session per the Local Governance Act, Section 681C, which is information that could cause financial loss or gain to a person or the local government or could jeopardize negotiations leading to an agreement. Could I have a mover to go to close? Councillor Bennett, Councillor Heenan have moved and seconded. Any discussion on going to closed? All in favor of going to close, please signify by saying aye. And any opposed? That's everybody. We will give a minute for technology to shut down.